<laughs> How's everybody today? Doing well? Awesome, awesome, awesome. If you got a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 today. Um, it, was, uh, it was a good week. It was a long week. Anybody here come to Good Lovers After Dark? That was a good time. Come on now. All right, all right. Um, I just loved watching. We had so many people show up uh, to focus on and invest in their, um, their marriages. And I think that that is such a powerful thing when I see that. We're going to have another one coming up in probably a few months. Um, Beth and I, we had, we, we, as we were going through it, we were like, dang, we have so much more content that we wanted to share that we didn't really get to. Uh, but I do feel like it was really fruitful. But we're going to do more of that um, in months to come. And so, uh, but anyway, we're going to be at First Peter today. One of the things that we do as a church is we constantly are walking through the scriptures together, right? What I've said from day one, as, I've, uh, as my wife and I and our family uh, came here to start this church, was our opinions don't really matter. Uh, what we have to share with you is not all that important. What is important is that we open up the Word of God together, we study it, we allow it to read us more than we read it, and we allow it to point us to Jesus. And so my hope today is that we're going to jump right into uh, 1 Peter and uh, be pointed towards Jesus, because everybody walked in here today, and you came out of a week where everyone around you and everything around you wanted to constantly point you away from Jesus. Yes or no? Come on. Right? I mean, like, you feel that. You sense that in your soul. And so uh, we're going to be pointed towards Jesus today. So um, I, I love uh, the book First Peter because uh, I, I, I feel like I can relate to Peter more than probably any other uh, Old Testament or New Testament character uh, or person. Um, I love this book because Peter seems to me to be super relatable. He was married. He went uh, into the fishing business with his friends and his brother. He just seems like a normal guy, always seemed to be running his mouth when he shouldn't be, always seems to be like taking things too far. I'm known for that. Like there's the line here and I'm like, let's go, <laughs> right? And so Peter seems to be that guy. And uh, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in John chapter 21, you see that Jesus seems to appoint Peter as uh, not just the leader of the church, um, uh, as the church was going to be established, and Peter's the first one to give the first Christian sermon in Acts chapter 2, but he seems to be like the top apostle. I mean, we, don't, we can't say that definitively, but it, he seems to kind of operate in that role. And so the letter we have that we're studying through and have been studying through is called First Peter. It was uh, the first of the letters that we have from him, and we have two in the scriptures. Uh, and it's written about uh, 30 years after Christ uh, ascends to heaven, and during a time when Christians were being persecuted because of their allegiance to, uh, to Jesus above their allegiance to Rome and the Roman Empire. And so the purpose of this letter is to really just encourage Christians, followers of Jesus, to endure well as they're enduring this persecution and not to lose hope during these tough times. And so today we're going to pick it up in verse 13. <clears throat> and up until this point... Peter has really spent about 12 verses reminding Christians, reminding the followers of Jesus that they are the most blessed and the most privileged people on the planet, which is kind of nice to hear. I don't know if you know that, right? But, but Peter would look at you and he would say, guys, guess what? You, of all the people on the planet, you are the most blessed people, the most privileged people people that exist on the planet. And so uh, he has spent the first 12 verses going through that, and we're going to pick it up in verse 13. It says this. I'm going to read it all the way through. Therefore, I'll talk about what that word therefore is there for. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And that's quoting something that came out of actual Levitic, Levitic, Leviticus, but um, there's other references to that. Um, all right, so Paul starts this uh, scripture out by using that term, therefore. And my old pastor used to say, anytime you see the word therefore, you got to figure out what it's there for. And, um, and so let me help you understand this. Paul seems to be encouraging them prior to this uh, about a few things. He's like, listen, you're suffering. You're going through some hard times, but you need to remember who you are. 
Okay, verses 1 through 12 is this. You are God's chosen people. You have been given grace. You've been given mercy. You've been given power. You have been given endurance. You have this living hope and a salvation that includes this future eternal inheritance and it's imperishable, it's undefiled, it's waiting for you in heaven. And now having spent 12 verses being reminded and encouraged of this, Peter is going to talk about what they're supposed to do because of that, okay? He's going to be like, in view of what God has done for you through Christ, this is how you ought to live. That's what the therefore means, right? Now, you cannot miss the order. You have to be really careful here. The order matters. And the order in Scripture is always like this. It's always because of this, you operate like this. Peter is not saying, this is so important, he's not saying this is how you live your life in order to be God's blessed people and get heaven and all that. He's not saying that. The opposite is true. He's saying because of who you are and in light of all the things that God has done for you, this is now how you live. Do you see the difference? You see it? So you tend to have these two polar opposites. You you have religion and irreligion, okay? You have a a religion and irreligion. So you've got uh, irreligion says... I'm going to be my own God. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to find acceptance through my own means, right? I'm not religious. I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to find acceptance by my own means. And then you have this religious movement that says, okay, I'm going to obey God, and I'm going to do what he says I need to do, and I'm going to conduct myself the way that he says to conduct myself, and in doing so, I'm going to find acceptance through those means, right? Those are two polar opposite things. But what Paul is talking about here is the gospel, the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus, the gospel says, this is the thing that makes Christianity so different than everything else. The gospel message, the message of Jesus is, if you live your life by obeying these rules, it's irrelevant. What separates Christianity from every other religion in the world is the gospel of Jesus operates on the premise that I continually fail to obey even my own commands that I put upon myself, let alone God's. But because of what Jesus has done, I'm accepted anyway. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion. You have to understand, every other religion outside of Christianity, Muslim, Buddhists, Hindus, Mormonisms, every religion says, if you live your life by obeying these set of rules and conducting yourself in this way, you'll be accepted. But what we believe as followers of Jesus is Christ obeyed all the rules so that in the moments, in days and weeks and years in which we realize we can't, He has for us. And so what what Peter is talking about here is he's saying, okay, now, now that you understand that, therefore, you are ought to conduct yourself differently. And the point of the next four verses is to remind us, right, that for those of us who have received this new birth, our character, our conduct, ought to reflect the character and the conduct of our divine father, okay? And then he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 13. He says, so set your your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Let, let Let me ask you this question, okay? If somehow you knew, dream with me for a minute. If somehow you knew, oh, it'd be so cool that Jesus was going to come back by the end of this year, what would you do different? Like, if you knew, like, think about it. How, first off, how dope would that be? Okay, some of you be like, I don't know. I'd be really nervous, right? <laughs> but I'm like, if you knew, <clears throat> we thought this during like Y2K. Do y'all remember that? Some of you are old enough to remember that, right? right? I wasn't even a Christian, and I was like, I, I didn't even know who Jesus was. I was like, but he's coming back. Something is about to end. Do you remember that? That was so scary. So we threw a big party and got wasted. It was awesome. <laughs> so 
But if you really, really knew that he was going to crack the sky and return at some point before December 31st, okay, what would life look like from now until then? Like, would you do some crazy stuff? Think about it. Would you, would you do some, like, crazy stuff? I would, okay? Like, like, would you do something that you, like, bucket list stuff? Would you skydive? Like, I'm going for it. You know what I'm saying? Would you bungee jump? I don't know what the thing is that you're afraid to do. It. What, would you do it? Would you eat different? Come on, be honest. Like, who cares, guys? He's coming back. Like, who cares? Like, we are going to maul some Taco Bell from this moment forward. We are going all in, right? How many of y'all would cancel stuff? Like, just that mammogram that was scheduled? Mm Mm-mm, we ain't doing it. Listen, I'm a man. I'm a man. I've never had this done, but I'm married. And my wife is like, you do not want no mammogram, okay? You would cancel stuff. You cancel that colonoscopy. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. That's an Audi, not an Innie. We're not going there, right? <laughs> Dentist appointments. How many of y'all would just stop paying your mortgage? <laughs> right, right here. Like, nope, sorry. I've defaulted on that loan. I'm fine, right? Stop putting money away in retirement. I'm cashing out. How many of you would just quit exercising? Come on, I'm going to let myself go just a little bit. It's not a big deal anymore. My back hurts, but come December 31st, (laughs) you know? How many of y'all would probably mend a relationship? Come on, right? You know, like spend more time with your family. Some of you would finally ask that girl out. Some of y'all would get married. Some of y'all would be like, it's time. I got to hurry up and do this, right? Some of you, some of you have been doing it like the right way and you're like, I need a wife now. Before he comes back, I need to experience what this is. I need it, right? Come on. But if somehow, seriously, you knew that the end was around the corner and Jesus was coming back by the end of the year, how would you live? Jonathan Edward is, is considered to be, um, by many, an American hero. Uh, he was raised in the home of a pastor. He was called into ministry at a very early age. And um, he had a brilliant mind. He learned how to read and write Greek, Hebrew, and Latin by the time he was 12. If you don't feel stupid, okay, after hearing that, I don't know what will make you feel stupid. Uh, He graduated from Yale with a degree in uh, divinity before his 17th birthday. He became a lead pastor at a church in New York when he was 19. And during the 1700s, Edwards was pastoring a church in Northampton, Massachusetts, when God began to use him to revive the church in New England. to which eventually grew to be known as the Great Awakening. Um, I dream about seeing a day like that, but I'm so not like Jonathan Edwards, so I will not lead that most likely. You never know. I mean, who knows? But um, I, I long to see that again. And the reason I bring him up is because right before his 20th birthday, he wrote what were called 70 resolutions that he wanted to use to govern his life. By the time he was 20, he had already sat down and wrote out 70 resolutions that he wanted to use to govern his life. And they were never published um, until after his death. They were found in his journal when he died in his mid-50s. And I say this because these 70 resolutions, which he reviewed once a week, they weren't written to impress anybody. They weren't written to throw on social media. There wasn't that. It was between him and God. I want to read to you just four of them. The very first one is this. Resolve to do whatever I think to be most for God's glory. His 17th one was this. Resolve to live as I wish I had lived when I come to die. His 19th was resolve to never do anything I'd be afraid to do if I expected to hear the last trumpet in the next hour. His 52nd was this. This was like longer. He was journaling. He said, I frequently hear older people say how they would live if they were to live their lives all over again. Therefore, I resolve to live just as I think I will have wanted to live, supposing I live to an old age. And in other words, at 20 years old, Edwards realized, hey, I don't want to be one of those people who get to the end of their life and say, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it differently. Instead, he decided 
to lay before himself on a weekly basis, why not live in such a way that when I get to the end of my life and see Jesus face to face, I can look back and say, that's exactly how I wanted to do it. And so I pose to you this question, if you knew Jesus was coming back before the year was over, how would that affect your life? I can't answer that for you, but I think it's a question you ought to ask. And this is exactly what I think Peter has in mind when he writes these words, when he says, set your hope fully, all of your hope, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you because more grace is coming at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You can see here that Peter wants us to look forward to the future to gain our hope for today. Hope in the Bible is trust. It's confidence in a future certainty, right? It's an intellectual understanding that what God says will come to pass will actually come to pass guaranteed. And clearly, Peter's talking about the future grace of when Christ returns. Peter's like, look, he's coming back. And because he's coming back, think and operate and conduct yourself as if you know at any given moment he could crack the sky and enter back with his second coming. And then verse 13, though, he also says something here that to me was fascinating. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action and be or being sober-minded. So, it really had to dig deep to try to understand well, what does that mean? And um, the, the, the clearest example, and this is almost literally what, what he meant. It actually, the, the word literally means to like, uh, to gird up your loins, which you, that makes no sense to you. You're like, gird up my loins? What, <laughs> what am I doing? The clearest depiction and clearest example of what this means is this. Preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded is Roll up the sleeves of your brain or roll up the sleeves of your mind. It's time to get serious and start thinking clearly. That's what he's saying. Roll up, you you know, prepare yourself. Roll up your sleeves, right? Somebody comes at you, oh, you're like, all right, we're doing this, right? Roll up your sleeves for action. Get ready because you're going to have to like operate. It's time to think seriously and clearly. Peter wants Christians to prepare their minds, I love this, for deep and clear thinking. This is important to be reminded of today, okay? Because our society today is not driven by thought. We are driven by our feelings. In my experience, okay, far too often I find myself engaging in conversations where it's no longer a value to use your mind, right? This is true. It's no longer a value to use your mind. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not saying that in today's day and age we're, not, we're, we're against learning or we're against science. We're not against technology. We're not against education. What I'm saying is that in my opinion, and again, this is just my opinion, but in my opinion as a society, I think that we've lost our appetite for critical thinking. We no longer put a high value on using your minds. Let me explain. Most of us today... Believe what we believe. I'm, this is offensive, but I don't care. I haven't cared for 12 years. Why start now, right? <laughs> Most of us today believe what we believe, not because we've thought critically through it, but because we heard some sort of sound bite on social media or had some sort of experience and it emotionally moved us. And so now we think it's true. It's just true. And so I, I talk to a lot of people. This is part of my job, right? Talking to people. It comes with the nature of the job. And almost every day, almost every single day, I find myself engaging in conversations with people, usually, right, having deeper conversations. Very rarely does somebody want to have a conversation and want to talk about the weather, right? Like nobody calls, hey, Pastor Matt, I wanted to get together and grab a cup of coffee. I just wanted to talk about, like, how you were doing. That's never happened, Okay. <laughs> And some of you are like, oh, I'll do that. I'd love to know how you're doing. I don't need more friends. We're good. We're good. (laughs) I'm kidding. That was, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) 
But almost every day I find myself engaging in real life conversations about things like pain, worldviews, religious beliefs, personal problems, social issues. And almost every time, this is so true, almost every time I find myself asking somebody a question about what they think about a particular thing, they almost always respond by saying, well, well, I feel like, did you catch that? Oh, you want to know that? Well, I feel, I feel like, oh, look, let's talk about this social issue right here. Oh, well, I feel that. And I'm always like, oh, I didn't ask how you felt. I don't know what made you think I cared about how you felt. I don't care how you feel. I wasn't interested in your emotional response to that. I'm trying to understand what you think. I was asking what's going on in your mind, okay? And what Peter is saying here is so timely. It's so important. Peter's telling us that Christians among of all people should be people who do a really good job at thinking deeply about why we believe certain things, about why we do certain things, about why we act a certain way. And if most of why we believe what we believe or why we do what we do or why we act how we act is driven by what we feel in our hearts and not by what we think in our minds, then that can be a super dangerous place to live. And what Peter is saying in this verse is that Christians ought to be people who have the mental resolve, mental fortitude to think clearly and to use their minds to weigh their feelings. This morning, uh, we were over here as a team. I came out a little late, and Breno, uh, he asked me, he goes, uh, Matt, would you like to share something from your heart, right? He was like, Matt, would you like to share something from your heart? And I was like, uh... I had a long week. I feel tired. That's how I, that was the feeling that came from my heart. And then I sat there for a second. I was like, man, like they probably wanted something more from me, you know, <laughs> right? But what it was true in that moment, right, B? is my mind is saying God is good. My mind is saying God is sovereign. My mind is saying God is with me. God is for me. God is not against me. God loves me. God has forgiven me. God has uniquely uniquely made me and wired me and called me and drawn drawn, drawn me to his. All of that, that is just in my mind, yes, but in my heart, I'm, I'm just tired. Now, what do you do When you've done all you could do to think clearly and yet your feelings are not catching up to your mind. That's important. What do you do? When all the things I just said are true, my mind knows it's true, but my heart is like, it was a long week, right? Like I'm just kind of like, I'm just like tired. Just not vibing. Like what do you do when you feel unloved, when you feel like God doesn't like you? What do you do when you feel like God hasn't forgiven you? What do you do when you feel like you might be a little worthless or you feel like you're in a terrible season or you feel like this sickness will last forever? Like, what do you, what do you do when you feel, oh, you want me to really hit it? What do you do when you feel like you're attracted or drawn to somebody that scripture says you shouldn't be attracted or drawn to? What do you do when you feel as if, well, abortion isn't killing a baby? I just feel like it's just, just, you know, I just feel like, you know, it's just. What do you do when you feel like a man or a woman, but your biological makeup says otherwise? Oh, how dare you? What do you do when you've done all you can do to think clearly, yet your feelings are not catching up with your mind? What do you do? I'm glad you asked. Because Peter answers this. And he doesn't answer it in a way that's like taking your feelings into consideration. Because what we're acknowledging is, is sometimes your feelings don't catch up with your mind and therefore you got to lean into your mind. And so he says this, 
Here it is. So, do not be conformed to the passions or feelings of your former ignorance. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Peter refers to our unredeemed life as former ignorance. For, for the person who has experienced the grace and mercy and salvation that comes with following Jesus, knowing Jesus, we know that there, are, there, there is a time in our life where our passions, our feelings were fully dominated by our life. Like they were fully dominated, all of it. And Peter is telling us to not let our character or our conduct be molded by the decisions of our ignorant days, okay? Yes, sinful desires still, re still remain, of course. And they still do have some power in the hearts of believers, absolutely. But the Holy Spirit's presence in our life, the dominating force of sin it can now, because of the presence of God in our life, can be overpowered by the Spirit-led faithfulness. Yes, our old life was marked by unrestrained sinful impulses, for sure. And Peter reminds us that obedience to God will often look like the opposite of what seems to be natural, right? This is true. And so he says, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it was written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Okay, hope. Listen, real, real quick. What is holiness? Holiness means, most clearly, to be set apart. Separated from something for a unique purpose. That, that's why we call marriage holy matrimony because couples separate themselves from their own or from their old families and unite as a new family right this is why we call the bible the holy scriptures because it's been set apart from all other human writings right and christians believe that this is a sacred word for us that is different than every other word that has been given and christians similarly we are people who have been set apart as holy chosen people called by God to have a unique work with God. This is what holiness means. Holiness constitutes a very real sense of separation from evil and a dedication towards a life of righteousness that God has called us into, okay? And because of that, because of that, a lot of people just associate holiness as referring to being, oh, completely pure, right? Right? And yes, there's some truth to that. God's holiness, God who is holy, it does involve his complete purity, but purity is a byproduct of his holiness, not a way to obtain holiness, okay? So hear me say that. You ought to pursue holiness or pursue purity in all of your life because you're set apart as holy. It's a byproduct. Purity isn't what makes you holy. God is who makes you holy by setting you apart and now you ought to pursue a conduct of purity. Makes, does that make sense? Okay. So two big, qu big questions, and I'll close with this. How are we to be holy, and why should we be holy? How are we to be holy, and why should we be holy? All right, first is this. How should we be holy? Christians have historically attempted to be holy or set apart, right, through all sorts of weird extremes, right? You got the hermit mentality that just hides away from everybody in the world. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I literally have heard, I've had pastors say, well, you know, me and my family, we don't go to the beach. Oh, why? Well, you know, because all those heathens out there wearing those bathing suits. I'm like, whoa. First off, rock the two-piece, if you ask me. I don't rock a two-piece. I'm a single, but whatever. <laughs> I just got the one-piece going. I'm all exposed up top. So you got the hermit mentality. You also have the monk mentality, which is this is we only hang with those who are close, who, who share the close-knit commitment, right? We're away from the world's reach, and we're only with others who have solitude always because we are avoiding the world. 
But you also have this utopian mentality, right, which is very runs rampant in Christian circles here in America, where there's these groups of people that are trying to rebuild a perfect society in a world, right, without having worldliness be a part of their new utopian society, right? So you see this in, like, homeschoolers, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, you stay here, you don't move, you don't leave, you don't go outside, you play with the trees, and that's it, Okay? <laughs> Just kidding. Are they homeschooled? It was a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. I love y'all. I love y'all. I saw them laughing. I was like, dang it. Yeah, right here. It's all good. It's all good. You're the most normal homeschoolers I don't know. So, But then you also have this other group, right? It's like the Christian, the Christian uh, educational community, right? See, my kids go to Covenant Christian Academy, right? And my big fear was like, I'm listening. I'm like, listen, yo. I need to know that there's sin at this school. And basically, I need to know that you know that there's sin at this school. And, like, they haven't been so separated. We're not trying to create so, such a bubble, right, that our kids operate in this weird, weird utopian world where it's like we've created, you know, it's like the movie The Village. You know, you're just like, you know, you're like, you don't even know that this world exists. And then they go off to college and they see people out there doing this. They're like, oh my gosh, there's another world. Give me a drink. Give me that. I want to smoke that. I want to do, I didn't even know this existed. Let's go. I don't want that either, right? It's so interesting though. What happens oftentimes, like those, those examples in particular, if you're not careful, they're trying to obtain holiness by isolation, but a Christian solution to the problem of holy living while living in an unholy world is not isolation, it's insulation, okay? The church, the people of God, the family of faith, the local body of Christ, a, a, a people like Nekaz Church, right? We are meant to be an insulation, a covering, a support system that insulates and holds together the people of God as we live lives that are set apart from the ways of this world. This is why just coming on a Sunday is stupid. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. You haven't received the insulation that comes, the covering that comes with being deeply integrated into the life of the body of Christ. Okay, so the answer to how are we to be holy, he, he, he says, you do that as obedient children. That's the, that's the word that's used, as obedient children, where you're coming into the fold of the family where God is our father. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he has called you to be holy, is also holy, uh, be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Okay, this was this to me was like, I had like an aha moment this week. The next question I have is, why should Christians be holy? And the answer is this, and you're not going to like it. It's because it is written. Because it is written. Peter's reminding us of an incredible thing, the father-child theme of this context in this, in, in, in this text. Christians should want to be holy because we want to be like God our Father. His ways are better, and we should also be holy because as our Father, he's allowed to say, because I said so, Amen. as it is written, Hallelujah. because I said so. And, and so, so let, me, let me explain this, because those two things, as I said so, and also prepare your mind, can seem to be in conflict. Let me explain. I want you to think about the gap between me when I was 35, I'm 40 now, uh, and Jacob, who was eight when I was 35. Jacob's my youngest son. There are times right, where the 27-year gap between me as a 35-year-old father and Jacob as an 8-year-old son makes it impossible for him to fully understand what I'm trying to explain to him, even though he's trying his hardest to get it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. He literally doesn't have the cognitive ability to grasp why I'm telling you in this particular situation you need to do this or in this particular situation you shouldn't do this or here we are, hold my hand or go to bed or eat your food or don't do this or make sure you do that. 
It's not that he doesn't understand because I'm a bad communicator. It's not that he doesn't understand because he, he, he's a bad listener. He doesn't have the understanding because there's a 27-year gap that makes it impossible given his life experience and his limited development in comparison to mine, okay? He can't understand the depths of all of why the reasons I am telling him to do certain things, why he shouldn't do other things. Okay, so every once in a while, as a dad, what you do is you simply say, because it said so. That's not unloving. If anything, that's most loving. It's because I said so. Now take that 27-year gap between me and my son and think about the gap between you and the eternal God of the universe. Not only that, think about the mind of an all-knowing, infinite God. Everybody's obsessed with, like, ChatGPT right now. It's like, because it's, it's, it's like the ability to, like, a computer and artificial intelligence and their, its ability to learn and gather information is mind-boggling. But do you realize that as much as it's learning... It's nothing in comparison to the finite knowledge of God because God knows far more than every human that exists today. He knows far more. He knows far more than every human that has ever existed before. Okay? And so when Peter writes, since it is written, you should be holy. Conduct yourself in holiness. He's basically saying, I'm lovingly telling you Just do this because the Father says so. And the problem isn't that God can't clearly communicate all of the intellectual reasons as to why he's called us to conduct ourselves the way that he's called us to conduct ourselves. The problem is that for us, and, and you just need to just hold up and be cool with this, all right? We live in a society that celebrates arrogance. We literally have Pride Month, okay? You are a finite being with limited ability to fully understand. And so there are things that you will never be able to grasp this this side of heaven. And so when it comes to holy living as it pertains to how you handle things like money or marriage or sexuality or gender or forgiveness or love or or, or authority or desires, right? Or even the interactions that you have with your church... Nobody is telling you to not use your mind and to just think blindly or, or, or like absent of thought. The actual opposite is true. Paul's like, use your mind, think. But there will be times when your finite mind cannot understand. And in those moments when you don't understand, you are to still conduct yourself with holiness simply because I said so. And as a loving father, I know what's best. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. There it is. Let me pray for us. Father, I would ask right now that your people, this church, would ponder in their minds in their minds and ask the question in our minds based upon all we heard today Holy Spirit what are you saying to me? How might I need to live different now in light of the fact that you are returning? How might I now need to conduct myself differently because you said so. Speak clearly and give us a mind that can understand what it is that you're saying. Scriptures call it ears to hear. We love you. Amen.